physics. And physics, uh, physicists, especially theoretical physicists, have been really struggling with the question. And the question is, why is there something and not nothing? And they've, they've come up with every theory under the sun you could imagine to somehow exclude a personal God from that picture, whether it's a multiverse, whatever the case may be. But the question is, why is there something and not nothing? For those of us that are uh, uh, religious, we can, we can just rephrase that question a little bit. Why did God create the world? Why did God create the world? And this, I think, is, is a good, good question to start with. <clears throat> but I'm actually going to get around to it in a little bit. Uh, and hopefully it'll help tie everything together. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm going to give the answer, not at the beginning, but near the end, is because that's how God chose to do it. He revealed the purpose of creation uh, later. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the creation story itself and also the, the dogma, the doctrines. Uh, I think I said dogma, combined doctrine and dogma there. Uh, it's a, a micaism, maybe. Um, I combined the two. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, both what the scriptures tell us as well as what the church teaches us. Um, the, the first thing to remember is that God created out of nothing. Um, and sometimes I think when we think of nothing, we think of like the vacuum of space. Now, going back to my interest in physics, we know that there's even something in the vacuum, uh, like a space that God decided to fill. But when the Greek fathers of the church said that he created out of nothing, there really is nothing. There's no space. There's no time. Time, space, everything came into being, was willed by the Father, was made by his words, and was perfected by his Holy Spirit, as St. Irenaeus teaches us. Um, and so this is, a, this is an important thing to remember. Because if we remember this, we remember that everything in creation, everything that is, has its cause in the loving will of God, the Father, in the Holy Spirit, through his Son. Um, and this is important because, and as the Bible tells us, that when God created, he created it good. Um, in, in the ancient Greek, in the Septuagint translation, uh, the word that they used actually had a connotation not just of like a moral good, but as beautiful. So God created everything good, everything beautiful, everything true. Um, so we begin with Genesis, and we hear how the spirit was hovering over the waters. Now, some people uh, have misunderstood this to say that, oh, here there's something, these, these waters, this chaos of creation that God is then organizing. But Remember, if time itself begins at creation, in the beginning, we already have creation. So God has already created everything that he's going to make the stuff out of. The Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. The Hebrew is really interesting there because that, that word hover is, is usually what we find in English translations, but it actually has the same connotation as a hen brooding over its egg. And so we get this idea that the Holy Spirit is imparting his life, the life that he received from Father before all time, into this creation, is vivifying. Um, and then we get to the days of creation. Um, how many days of creation were there? Test your guys' biblical knowledge. How many days of creation? It's a little, little tricky. <laughs> Six. 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 Okay, bravo, bravo. Some people are like seven. There's seven days in a week, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to the number seven. And seven will actually, I think, help tie in that answer that I presented at the beginning of the class. So in the first three days, if we follow the Genesis narrative, God is creating spaces. He's creating the sea. He's creating the heavens. 
Um, and then he begins to fill it. He begins to fill the heavens. So it's actually on the fourth day that God created the sun, the moon, the stars. The heavens are filled. So the heavens are made on the first day. The fourth day, he fills it. Um, and this, this has a, a really an interesting point. Um, so the scriptures, most, I think, biblical scholars uh, are more or less agreed that the, what we commonly think of as the Old Testament, and, and it it's, behooves us, I think, to remember that there wasn't a book, right? Jesus wasn't handed like the Old Testament. Uh, there was a, a diversity of books. You know, there was a scroll of Isaiah, there was the, the Pentateuch or the Torah, uh, and there wasn't even, uh, even at the time of Christ, there wasn't uh, a uniform, okay, these are the authoritative books, these are the less. Pretty much everybody, everybody had those first five books of the Old Testament and the Psalms. Uh, some of them, like the Sadducees, excluded some of the prophets or certain prophets. Um, some of the, for example, the uh, Jewish believers in, in Egypt, uh, in Ethiopia, actually had some of these books of Enoch. So there, there are a number of different diversities of canon. But even that's a little bit of a misnomer because there wasn't a set canon. Um, why, why is this important? Well, if the... Scriptures were compiled during the Babylonian exile. Now, it's, it's important to remember that I'm not saying that there was nothing before, uh, but rather there were, there were oral traditions. There were the, the written, or not yet written, words of Moses that were being passed down. Um, but it really began to be uh, compiled during this Babylonian exile. Um, and there's a really interesting point here on when we look at the days of creation, right? So if you think about Babylon, right? Here, the Jewish people are in exile. The people of God are in exile. They find themselves in strangers in a strange land, to, to again, quote the scriptures. Um, and they were surrounded by a culture, by a people that had a faith that was contrary to the faith that was revealed to them by God on Mount Sinai. Um, and in Babylon at this time, the two main deities was the God of the sun and the God of the moon. Now, here we see this polemic that they placed in the creation story. Because what do we have three of before the sun and the moon are created? Three days, right? So what, what is a day? And here on the fourth day, when the sun and the moon are created, they're not even given names. It doesn't say God created the sun and the moon and the stars, but rather the greater light and the lesser light. And so this is basically the, the Jews in Babylon saying, ha, ah, our God created, and not only did he create, but he didn't even need the things that you have deified, the things that you have made God. Those, if you look at that narrative of creation, it's almost an afterthought, right? And so here we're, we're given a view that there's, this personal God who created everything out of nothing, including that which the nations worshipped as gods. These things are creatures, whether it's the angels that ended up falling, that were adopted by some people as their deities um, in a traditional paganism, the sun and the moon, all of these things are creations of God. So those first three days, the space is created, the three days, or the final three days of creation, he's filling those spaces. And the last thing that he creates, of course, is us, is humanity. And if you look at Genesis, there's actually two uh, somewhat different accounts of the creation of mankind. And there's two very important uh, messages in both of these accounts. The, the one account that's kind of considered the more general account uh, we hear how God, and it's very interesting here because God speaks to him, speaks of himself in the plural. We create, right? Not, not an I. And so the fathers of the church tell us that already here at the beginning, we have an intimation. We have uh, uh, God speaking as a communion, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, 
And so when man is created, you see this movement back and forth between the singular and the plural. He created them, or he created him, male and female, right? It goes back and forth, forth between the singular and the plural. And it's, it's a really interesting thing because it, in many ways, the creation of man is reflecting God, right? God is a communion of persons, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that are also one. And so here, I think uh, the scriptures are teaching us, the church teaches us that we as people are also a unity where to be one body. And this is fulfilled ultimately in Christ's prayer that they all be one, but we also are unique persons, right? And so here we have uh, this image of God seen as that, that unity in the diversity. Um, the second creation account, this is the one perhaps that we're more familiar with, where it says that God formed man from the dust of the earth and that he breathed the breath of life, the Holy Spirit, and that man became a living soul. And this is also an important thing to remember. And I, I really don't want to take up uh, much time with this because ink and blood has been spilled over this. But a lot of people uh, argue, like, well, what about evolution? What about, is, was it a literal, you know, is the earth billions of years old? All these, all these things. That's not the point. It's not the point of the, the writers of scripture. It's not what is trying to be convey, conveyed, right? Science asks the question, what something is, right? Water, it's H2O, right? Uh, asks the question on how something came about. This is how this was made. This is how this came about. What the scripture is interested in is the why. That going back to that first question, why is there something and not nothing? Or why did God create the world out of nothing? Um, the scriptures, the church answer that question of why, and more importantly, answers the question of who, who it was that created the world. Um, so to, to get into debates, arguments on how God created is really, in, in some sense, it's, it's uh, uh, in the case of, of science, scientists can do what they want. They can explore. Um, a good scientist will tell you that more often than not, they're wrong, right? You notice the kind of the development of science, what we believed 500 years ago is radically different from what we believe now. Um, but we still have that hubris. This is how things came about. This is how things are made. 500 years from now, there's going to be something different. Whereas what the church and the scriptures have said on why creation is and who created has always been consistent. Um, and so I, I do just want to say very briefly uh, what the second creation account of man is teaching us is that apart from God, we are nothing. We're dust. But with God, with his breath we become a living soul and not only a living soul but one that's able to image one that's able to reflect god himself we're created after the image and the likeness of god as genesis teaches us um but we know from that creation account that only one person was made and that was adam so we'll, we'll, we'll come back down. Don't worry, I won't forget about Eve, our better halves. Um, but I want to get to the seventh day. The seventh day is the day that God did what? Rest. God rested. And here is the key to answering that first question and really unlocking the meaning of everything. I think we've heard this story. We've grown up in some sort of uh, Christian tradition, we've heard this story a thousand times. And with so many things, we hear the story so often, we forget its strangeness. Right? God. Was he tired? Was he like, boy, you know, doing all this work, I need to take a break. What does the church tell us? The church tells us that on the seventh day, God rested. And where did God rest? 
And this is the key, I think, that unlocks everything. He rested in the tomb. That first Sabbath is a prophecy, it is a foreshadowing of the great Sabbath. And we can now look back, right? When God created mankind, ultimately we were created, we fulfilled our human purpose when he died on the cross, when we were truly recreated, right? And this is, I think, what will open up that second story of the creation of man to us. How was Eve made? From a side. From a side. Right? On Holy Friday, on the Friday that every Friday finds its fulfillment and its meaning in, Christ was crucified. And after he died on the cross, what did the soldier do? Pierce his side. Pierce his side. And out of the side flow water and blood. The church fathers tell us that it's the water of baptism. It's the blood of communion, the blood of the Eucharist. And it was from his side that God created his bride, which is the church, that's formed through the waters of baptism and the sharing in the blood of the Son of Man. And so all of the mysteries of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, have as the key that unlocks it, that opens it, St. Maximus tells us, he who is the Alpha and the Omega, Christ himself. So here we begin to see what the church teaches us is the answer to that question I began with. The purpose of creation was the incarnation, that God created that which was other than himself with the purpose of, through him, ultimately through his son, bringing that creation into relationship with him. That before the creation of the world, all that was, was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in this eternal, perfect communion, community of love. And that creation, ultimately through Christ and in the church, is now brought into that communion. St. Bophidio, the contemporary saint of our church, says, when asked, when was the church born? He says, the church is without beginning that that pre-eternal church was that community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that in Christ, through the mysteries, through the blood of the Eucharist, the water of baptism, we're now brought into that uncreated, that pre-eternal church. So as, as we talk about the Old Testament, as Father shares with us about the growth of Evangelion, we, we need to remember that the key to unlocking the scriptures is Christ incarnate, crucified, and risen from the dead. Um, and this even, even begins to direct us towards that uh, first day, that first day when the Holy Spirit was hovering above the waters. Where in the New Testament do we see the Holy Spirit hovering above water? The heavens were opened. The Holy Spirit descended. The voice of the Father. The voice of the Father. At the baptism of Jesus. At the baptism of Jesus. When Christ enters into creation, is revealed who it is that he is, the Son of the living God. This is the true beginning of creation. Because this is creation now that isn't just good and beautiful, but true. Right? And what do I mean by true, not factual, but in Greek, the word aletheia comes from that, that prefix a, which is a negation, and lethe, which means forgetfulness. So not to forget that which is true is ultimately, in the ancient Greek mind, that which is eternal. But creation only had that uh, ability to be eternal when Christ fully entered into it, when he fully entered into our lives, which the Jordan River is a symbol of, 
Um, and of course, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about baptism and the baptism of Christ when we get to it. Um, but I think those are some of the, the key points in understanding the story of creation. The purpose of creation was the incarnation. Some people think, well, didn't God become man because we screwed everything up? And I always say, we screwed everything up, but God was still able to do what he wanted to do without, again, violating our freedom, which I think is perhaps the most beautiful thing. Um, this is a nice <coughs> image here of the expulsion from paradise. Maybe we talk about, talk about that a little bit. So we have that, that, uh, that pretty tree at the top. And uh, this is, this is uh, another part of the story that, especially in contemporary times, has become rather uh, controversial. Uh, and what I mean by that is, this is where, uh, historically, men like to kind of point their finger at their wives. It's your fault. You'd still be in paradise if it wasn't for you. You messed it all up for us. Get going. And people historically have used this to even justify the way that they treat women. There are some fathers, and this isn't, isn't uh, uh, maybe not universal, but there are some of the most profound fathers of the church, thinkers of the church, like St. Maximus the Confessor, contemporary fathers like St. Siloan, who take a little different approach to it. They say, yes, God said, do not eat from this tree. Now, eating of the tree, he says, if you do it, you will die. On the day you eat of it, you will die. The important thing to remember, he doesn't say, I'm going to kill you when you eat from the tree. Right? Eating from the tree had consequences. But these fathers that I referenced, that's not where they put their finger on the fall. Where did they put the finger on the fall? They tell us that God is walking in the garden. Now, again, some people say, well, you know, maybe the ancient Jews believed that God had a, a physical form. How are we to understand this? And again, we have to see this in the light of Christ. On Holy Tuesday evening, there's a beautiful service and a, a, an amazing hymn called the Hymn of Cassiani, where she talks in this hymn, she says, speaking as the woman who anoints Christ's feet right before his, his crucifixion and his burial. Uh, in this hymn, she says that the woman, again in the first person, washes the feet that Adam and Eve heard walking in the garden. Icons tell us the same thing. If you see an icon of creation, if you see an icon that's describing this event, it shows Christ walking in the garden. An important thing for us to remember. It all moves, all has its cause from Christ. So what happens? Christ is walking. They hide themselves, right? They realize that they're naked. They hide themselves. He asks them, you know, who told you that you're, you're naked? These fathers tell us so beautifully that Christ is giving them an opportunity to repent, to undo what they've begin, begun to break. But what does Adam do? Adam says, it was the woman But he doesn't stop there. He says it was the woman that you gave. Bringing in those first divisions, the division between man and God, and the division between man and neighbor. Not without accident, when Christ comes and teaches us, he says that all of the law and the prophets, here speaking, in this case, specifically about what happened in Genesis. All of the law and the prophets are fulfilled in these two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's in our love for each other, our love for God, 
that finds its ultimate fulfillment in the Eucharistic meal that we share, that the fall is truly overcome. Uh, St. Nicholas Cavasilas, a great saint of our church, tells us that in baptism, when we are buried with Christ and we rise with Christ, we overcome the consequence of that eating of the fruit of the tree. When we share that agape meal, we share the Eucharist, we become one body because there's one bread, as St. Paul tells us. We overcome those divisions that Adam introduced into creation. Um, so, of course, they're expelled from paradise. And there, the hymns of the church tell us that Adam wept. Um, and he, he wept because he had realized that not only was paradise lost to him, but this state of paradise, this space and state of being in a proper relationship with God had been broken and had been fractured. But so beautifully, the key is given to us, or it was given to Adam on how we can return to paradise. And this is where we, we can talk about the Rote Evangelium. <clears throat> uh, I think so. Okay, so I'll take I'll take over from here. Are right, you guys follow uh, so far? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to talk about here is first I'm going to dwell a little bit more on this fall, right? Because actually uh, we we tend to talk about the fall being when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, but there are really multiple falls that happen in Genesis. Uh, one of which is uh, the devil himself. The devil has fallen from being an angelic being. Uh, some say out of envy for man, some say out of pride, um, but he himself fell and he is manifest as the serpent who tempts Eve. <clears throat> and for tempting Eve, God uh, curses him and uh, gives him a judgment that he shall crawl in his belly all the days of his life and eat dirt. Uh, it's interesting there that dirt, dust, dirt is, is the symbol of of kind of nothing, right? Because God created man out of dirt or dust, <clears throat> uh, meaning out of nothing. If we, apart from God's breath, we have no life. <clears throat> um, so what are the consequences of the fall? So here I want to uh, just concentrate on a second because there's a difference here between the East and the West, between the Orthodox Church and what is typically taught in the Western Church since St. Augustine. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so what happens with the, the fall, right? When Adam and Eve are expelled from paradise. First and foremost, the fall caused mankind to become subject to mortality, right? And then uh, in Genesis, uh, that's Genesis 3.19. In Genesis 3.21, it says that they put on garments of skin. Uh, garments of skin. Now, that can be taken literally, meaning that they started to wear clothing made out of animal uh, garments, but the fathers of the church also tend to think of it as this is when we took on our more fleshly existence, right? <clears throat> that uh, So before that, they had a body of some kind, you know, and perhaps we should be thinking in terms of the resurrected body that we anticipate inheriting, that Jesus Christ already inherited, where he was able to pass through walls, he was, but he was able to eat. Uh, Thomas was able to touch his side. So he was material in some way, but it was a spiritualized body. This is the kind of body that we look forward to having in the resurrection. And some of the fathers speculate that something like that may have been may have happened in, in paradise, that, that they didn't have the same kind of coarse material, the fleshly material that we have that's subject to, uh, uh, which is inclined to sin. <clears throat> All right, so here, this is interesting. So with the fall, uh, we become subject to mortality. In other words, we can die. But in the West, this is, has been viewed as a punishment or a penalty. Right, that we we could die because God punished us, but actually it doesn't say that it was a penalty or a punishment. Um, like Father Micah mentioned, you know, think about it in terms of uh, you know, if you're a parent and you have a small child and you tell the small child, don't touch, don't touch the hot stove or you'll get burnt. And let's say this child goes and touches the hot stove. Does it mean that the parent punishes them by by burning them? No, 
it means that there's a consequence to their free will uh, decision to touch the hot stove. It's not that the father willed that they suffer, right? <clears throat> so it's the same in our mentality too. The father, it wasn't that he wanted to withhold uh, that which was in the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. It was that he was waiting until the appropriate time when man could mature in his relationship with God, that the relationship between them could grow to the appropriate point, to appropriate maturity. And at that time, he would let them taste of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wasn't withholding anything from them, but merely waiting for them for the appropriate time. <clears throat> So, and he tells them for their benefit, don't eat of it yet, right? But what do they do out of their own free will? God respects our free will. He, Adam and Eve eat of, the, eat of it. It's not then that God punishes them. Rather, it's a mercy. Because they have taken this knowledge before they are mature enough to handle it, um, the, God introduces uh, mortality. God introduces death as a mercy and not a punishment. All right, so what does it say here? St. Gregory the Theologian writes, yet here too he provides a benefit, namely death, which cuts off sin so that evil may not be everlasting. Thus his punishment is changed into a mercy. So the Orthodox Church views the introduction of death as a response to sin uh, as a mercy. It cuts off, uh, it cuts off evil. All right. Now, what is it about mankind has an inclination towards sin? <clears throat> because all mankind fell away from the grace of God through Adam's disobedience, man now has a propensity, a disposition, or an inclination towards sin. All right, so here we have to think about, uh, it's helpful to think in terms of um, what fell uh, was really human nature. <clears throat> now, this is kind of an ancient concept that's a little bit difficult for us to grasp in the West. But like Plato, for example, uh, had a very developed sense of this. So Plato would say, for example, that there is a chair nature, right? <laughs> um, that you, there are different kinds of chairs. This is a chair. It's got a back. It's got armrests. It, it rolls. Uh, but that's a chair also, right? Even though it doesn't roll. And there are other chairs in the chapel and elsewhere that fold up, that have armrests, that don't have armrests. But we all recognize that's a chair, right? We don't think about it. That's a chair, even though they're different. <clears throat> so there's something about a chair that we all recognize that makes it a chair, right? That's the chair nature, we would say. And then each individual chair is a specific uh, hypostasis, a specific example of a chair. So just in the same way, each of us is a hypostasis of a human being. We're an individual human being, but we all share the same human nature. Now, what the Eastern Orthodox Church says is that what's, what fell was our human nature. So if we imagine that there was like a stamp for the ideal chair, right? And that is a mold for the ideal chair. And there's a mold for the ideal human being, right? Which is Jesus Christ. And this mold, this mold got a crack in it when Adam and Eve sinned, right? And there was a, the human nature, there, it was introduced a rupture in human nature that, that hindered our relationship with God. That crack in the mold continued to exist until Christ came and healed that crack, and he recreated humanity, right? So that now we have the possibility of attaining to the fullness of the stature of Christ, as St. Paul says. So what we say fell in the fall was the human nature, which all of us share in because we participate as individuals in the one human nature that has this crack in it now. But we do not say that this, we've all inherited this sin through the act of sexual reproduction, right? Which is what St. Augustine said, <laughs> and this became the classic teaching of the West. So, for example, so it says here, we, so we would say that man has inherited this propensity or inclination towards sin, because just as death entered the world through sin, now sin enters the world through fear of death, right? This is something that we emphasize, that the fear of death is what motivates us, uh, what, what kind of secretly this existential uh, terror that we all have is what motivates us toward evil. <clears throat> now here it says, in the West, many Christian denominations is, insist that along with the inclination to sin, we enter this world, in other words, we're born, with the guilt of Adam's sin on our soul. 
So this is something we do not, the Orthodox Church does not ascribe to this view. This view came about through the teachings of the Blessed Augustine of Hippo, uh, whose teachings were and still are quite popular and definitive in Western Christianity. <clears throat> However, for the Church Fathers of the East, we are not guilty because of Adam's sin, but because of our own sin. Right? All right. Then this, this is interesting because many of us coming, uh, if we are from a Reformed tradition or a Calvinist Presbyterian tradition, because of our strong propensity to commit sin, the image of God and man, and we were made in his image and likeness, this kind of mold or stamp, is fallen, right? In the West, Calvinism specifically tends to take this a bit too far, teaching the doctrine of total depravity. This essentially means that as a consequence of the fall, Apart from what he calls irresistible or enabling grace of God, there's kind of distinctions he makes about grace. Every person born into this world is completely unable to choose by themselves to follow God, to refrain from evil, or to accept the gift of salvation. In other words, God must initiate the relationship and do all the heavy lifting. And for us, this view necessitates a denial of free will, which God has worked so hard to preserve. He gave Adam the free will. Uh, his plan, Father Micah didn't quite get to this part, but, but Christ's coming was not plan B, guys. This wasn't plan B, God's response to, oh, shoot, uh, man messed up. I didn't anticipate this. Now I've got to come up with another plan. No. St. Athanasius uh, the Great tells us in the fourth century, it was God's plan all along to send his only begotten son <clears throat> because he created the world out of nothing and he wanted to unite it with himself. How else could he do this but by taking on the king of creation, by becoming the, his capstone as the king of creation, man himself, and fully uniting in himself so that everything points toward Christ. Everything is fulfilled or summarized in Christ, as it says in Ephesians. All right. Uh, okay. So he would have had, so Christ would have become incarnate even if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen, right? What probably happened was that it simply delayed, delayed uh, Christ's coming into the incarnation because God had to wait until there was a, an appropriate woman in order to bear the Son of God. You know, the Orthodox Church teaches that this was the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, that she was the, the, the best that the human race had to offer. Uh, she wasn't perfect. She wasn't a, a God of some kind. She wasn't the fourth person of the Trinity. But among us humans, she was the most holy that we could ever offer. <laughs> and it was for that reason that God decided at that time to come down and be incarnate of her. All right, so getting back to this denial of free will and the Calvinist position, which, which insists that not only are, do we have a propensity to evil, but that we are uh, bound to do evil. <laughs> It says here, naturally, this contradicts the position of the early church, which insists on the inherent goodness of human nature. As Father Mike has said, God created a thing and he created them in a very good, Leon Kalos, it says, very good. Um, God is not the author of evil. That which he creates cannot be evil in its nature, right? It can be distorted. It's been distorted by man's free will and the introduction of sin, but it's not evil by nature. Right? So it cannot be totally depraved, as Calvin says. Uh, so even in our fallen state, subject to ancestral sin. So this is the term that we prefer rather than original sin. We are still capable of doing good. Although bondage to death and the influence of the devil often dulls our perception of what is good and leads us into sin. This creates a synergistic relationship between mankind and God, one in which we are fellow workers with him on the path to our salvation, as it says in 1 Corinthians, fellow workers. So this is a really important concept in orthodoxy, syn synergia, uh, cooperation, working together with God. This is also tied into the orthodox concept of theosis, uh, of the purpose uh, of our lives is to become like God. God became man so that man might become God-like. Right? so that we can grow into the likeness of this restored human nature that Christ brought to us. <laughs> so we really emphasize this synergy, not that God has to do everything for us, but that we actually have a say. Now, it may be, if you remember on the old computers, uh, it would, a lot of times you'd be downloading an update, right? And it would, it would be crawling along, you're waiting and you're waiting for it to download this big update, right? <laughs> and then finally gets to 50, 60, 70%, gets to 
and then it would seem to hang out there forever, right? <laughs> so God, God does 99%, right? But he still waits for us to contribute that 1%, or even less, right? But there still is some role for our cooperation with God. <laughs> this is something that we would emphasize. All right, uh, let's see. So original sin, so I just want to cover this really quick. Original sin, instead of original sin, which is used in Western Christianity, the Orthodox Church uses the term ancestral sin to describe the effect of Adam's sin on mankind. We do this to make one key distinction. We didn't sin in Adam. All right, so here's what happened. <clears throat> this is actually a mistranslation of Romans 5.12. In Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. <clears throat> so as through one man, this is the proper translation, through one man sin entered the world. The problem was Augustine, as, as brilliant as he was, did not read Greek. <clears throat> and in the Latin translation, not to get too into the minutia of Greek versus Latin, but the way the Latin translated that word through made it seem like it said in, right? That it was in one man, in Adam that we sent. And so Augustine took this to mean that it was in Adam's seed, right? And there's another phrase where it talks about Adam's seed. So he came to think of it as through the act of natural human procreate, sexual procreation, but this was how sin was passed down. And then he found other verses that he took to kind of support that, like in the Psalms where David says, I was conceived in iniquities. But this all kind of started with Augustine. <laughs> the Orthodox Church has never held this position, that it's through the natural sexual reproduction that we all inherit the kind of sin. No, it's simply because we're human beings. That's it. And we share in human nature. All right. Um, all right, I think I'm going to cover that. All right, so now I want to cover, uh, well, first, I want to talk a little, just really quickly about confidence. So the thought resulted in three impediments to union with God, which is, which is salvation. Salvation for us is union with God. One, human nature fell. God's image in man fell and suffered darkness, such that fallen human nature could no longer commune with God and behold his glory. Two, sin entered the world. Mankind's disobedience and rejection of God allowed the sickness of sin to dominate his soul, and sin willingly became routine. And notice here we talk about the sickness of sin. This is something that distinguishes uh, us from the Catholic Church in particular. The Catholic Church, because of this idea that it's this inherited guilt for sexual reproduction, there's a sense that um, there's a sense that there's a kind of uh, guilt, and you get the you get the image almost of a legal court, right? <clears throat> and that Christ had to die to pay the penalty for us, uh, but we still have to extinguish our guilt, etc. The Orthodox Church prefers a different concept. Rather than the concept of a courtroom, we prefer the concept of a hospital, right? So we are all sick with sin. We're not all guilty with sin. That might be part of it, but we're sick with sin. And this changes the way we think about things. Rather than thinking about someone as you're guilty, uh, we think about it as, you know, you, you don't go to someone who has cancer and say, you're guilty, right? You did this to yourself. You, that's not a, a normal way of, of thinking, right? We're all, we're all sick with sin, and we need to be healed. This is the Orthodox Church's approach. So the church is not a courtroom where we're judged, where we're acquitted, where Christ's merits are placed in our defense, etc. The Orthodox Church is a hospital where it receives our sick souls, and it treats us as, as uh, you know, the priests, the, the bishops, the sacraments. These are all the medicines and the medical personnel that we use to treat the sickness of sin in our souls. <clears throat> and finally, death entered the world. So separated from God by this fracture in our relationship, this fracture, rupture in human nature, uh, this, our, our, sub, our sickness, our, our sickness of sin subjected mankind to mortality, as we said. But again, this wasn't as a punishment, but as a way to cap the evil that can be done through us. <clears throat> All right. Here's what I want to highlight here, anthropos, anthropos. So anthropos, 
is the uh, Greek word for man, right? This is a normal word, not just for man, but for human, human being. Man in a generic sense, which includes woman. Um, okay. Um, so what does anthropos mean in Greek? It means an, anthropos means looking up. That's what the Greek word means for, for a human being. One who looks up. So the Greeks noticed that animals tended to have their head toward the ground, right? Animals were oriented toward the things of this world, but it was only man who stood upright and erect and could look up into the sky. So man from the beginning was oriented toward God. It was the only part of creation that could serve as this bridge between God and man, right? So uh, that's why man is not only called the king of creation, but the priest of creation. It's our all of our job from the beginning has is a priestly role. In order, in other words, to take the material world and to offer it up to God so that He can bless us and send it back down to us again. Man is this bridge between the created world <clears throat> and God. That's why we're the stewards of creation, right? Not just ones who have dominion over creation, but we're the ones who are in charge of taking care of creation, including the animals <clears throat> and the earth itself. All right, so now for the syllabus, we wanna cover, uh, the last part we wanna to cover today is Abraham. <clears throat> so God simply did not leave us as we are. As we said, he had a plan all along to incarnate Christ. But now this plan was perhaps delayed a little bit while he waited for man to mature enough to the point that we can begin to accept, right? <clears throat> so what happened? Here's a little reading. This is, this is the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese website. Um, it's a good website with lots of good information. So the patriarch Abraham, he was born a pagan 10 generations after Noah, according to tradition. So, so after the fall, of course, uh, we have a period, we have uh, Noah, we have the flood, we have Noah, and then 10 generations after Noah, um, when the knowledge of God had perished from among men, God <clears throat> called this man Abram, as he was called then, out of his land, out of the Chaldees, which is modern day Mesopotamia. So Iraq, Iran, somewhere around there. So he was called from the east to the land of Canaan, in other words, modern day Palestine, modern day Israel. And he received the promise that through his seed, all the nations of the earth should be blessed. <clears throat> all right. This is another Google um, resource for you. This is the Orthodox Church in America website, the OCA. And it also is very reliable. There's a lot of stuff on the internet that is not reliable. So um, I, would, I would be careful what you read on the internet, especially things that are, that, that are very uh, combative. Uh, I would avoid those because sometimes the people will get into these discussions and they like to debate, well, we believe this and you're wrong and you're wrong. And I, would, I would avoid anything that has that kind of uh, ethos to it. <clears throat> All right, so salvation history, probably so-called, begins with Abram, whom God named Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Abraham was the first patriarch of the people of Israel. So this is the beginning of God's plan to, uh, to save the world, to save man, his creation. He was going to call people to himself, and it started by calling this one man, Abraham. <laughs> the word patriarch, which is the title given to Abraham, means the father of the people. All right. So God made the first promise of his salvation of all the people of the earth to Abraham, with whom he also made his covenant to be faithful forever. This is one of the covenants or promises that God makes with man. Here we go from Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and kindred in your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So the fulfillment of this promise to Abraham comes in Jesus Christ, who is Abraham's seed. Because in other places in scripture, it says that through Abraham's seed, uh, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed, seed singular. And so Jesus Christ is a singular descendant, a uh, seed meaning descendant. And a lot of times it's in the plural seeds, referring to someone's descendants, plural. But in scripture, it sometimes says Abraham's seed, singular. The church takes us to be a foreshadowing that it would be fulfilled in one person, one descendant, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 
So, and it's, so it's through him that, the, that all the nations of the earth, not just his people, Israel, but all the nations of the earth, according to the promise to Abraham. Uh, here's, here's Paul in Galatians 3. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, singular. It does not say, and to offspring, was referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, which is Christ. So it's, that's Paul himself, Galatians 3.16. So, and Abraham's faith is prototypical of all those who in Christ are saved by faith. The New Testament stresses faith as necessary for salvation. The model for this faith is Abraham himself. Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. So this word righteousness, uh, the Greek word can also be translated justification. So sometimes you'll hear this term justification by faith. So what it means is righteousness, being righteous according to God. <clears throat> so Abraham's faith, we talked about this a little in the sermon last week, faith and works, right? So faith versus works became a big problem in the, uh, in the Protestant Reformation, which actually tomorrow, October 31st, it will be 505 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And there, starting with Luther, when he nailed the 95 theses on the wall, on the door of the church, uh, this debate developed about faith versus works. Before that, the church had never really heard or known of this debate, that there, was, that there could be a debate between faith versus works. Both were considered necessary. So the Orthodox Church, when in response, when the, in the West, the Protestants and the Catholics were debating back and forth, faith, no, well, faith, works, faith, works. They, they would appeal to the Orthodox and uh, say, well, what do you believe? Is it faith or works? And we would say, yes. <laughs> it's faith and works. <clears throat> All right, so we see here in James, we read, uh, talked about last Sunday. Was not Abraham our father justified, made righteous by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active. So it's active faith. Faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. <clears throat> so in other words, it's this active faith that is shown in works. All right, so this is the sacrifice of Isaac uh, was Abraham's faith acting out, uh, manifest. <clears throat> and then it goes on to talk about here that also in Abraham's life, we see, the, we see a foreshadowing of the perfect priesthood of Christ when uh, Abraham comes across this mysterious figure of Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or the king of peace is what Salem means. And Melchizedek, Melchizedek was this priest uh, who was considered a foreshadowing of the great high priest of Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> As it says in Hebrews, uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in other words, it explains why Jesus didn't have, Jesus wasn't from the Levitical line or from Aaron's line to uh, inherit the priesthood, but he was from the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews, from this mysterious uh, priesthood. <clears throat> Um, so there's, there's a tie-in with Abraham and Abraham's encounter with, uh, with Melchizedek, and Abraham offers him 10%, just as we continue to teach to this day, that we offer 10%, uh, a tithe. That's literally what a tithe means, 10%. It doesn't mean whatever I feel like it means. It means 10%. It doesn't mean one and a half or three quarters of a percent. Literally, tithe means 10 so 10% is what Abraham offered from his spoils to Melchizedek. And then there's one more, Abraham addressing uh, the three angels who visited Abraham. <clears throat> so again, in the life of Abraham, we see a foreshadowing the Orthodox Church teaches of the Trinity. And this icon here is the famous icon from Russia by Rublev, <clears throat> the Holy Trinity. So you, you can see this icon is very famous because you see how, you see my mouse with my cursor there? You see how it looks like what? This line. If you follow this line, what does it look like? A goblet. A goblet, a chalice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a chalice. So we have this communion, this perfect proportion here, <clears throat> this communion between the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Which, by the way, 
you know, this is the one thing that existed before the nothingness of the world. There was the Holy Trinity existed from all time, right? The Son begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father, um, and that this tri-hypostatic God, right? So hypostasy is like we said, is an individual uh, instantiation of something. So you have the three hypostases or persons of the Holy Trinity. And God the Father is not monohypostatic. He's not a single person, as is taught, for example, in Islam. Now, what does that mean for us? It means that God, St. John tells us God is love, right? We all know that quote from Scripture. God is love. How can God be loved if he's only a single person, right? You can say that God is loving, if he's a single person, but you can't be loved unless there's something to love, right? So the God, as it says in the beginning, let us make man in our, in our image and likeness. God is this communion of persons, right? These three persons that share a perfect love and communion between themselves. So this is what you see in this icon, this kind of perfect proportion, this perfect kind of circle that goes around them. And then interestingly, this form of a uh, a chalice where we have holy communion, right? So we enter, in, we enter into that communion of the three persons of the Trinity through the holy chalice when we commune with the holy body and blood of Christ. All right, so that was a very quick uh, overview of thousands of years. Uh, let's see, stop sharing. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I know that's probably a lot to soak in. But we only have 12 lessons to cover all this stuff. Yeah, Alex. Um, you mentioned taking the material world and sending it up to God. Yeah. I'm curious what exactly that means if that's related to how we should observe our relationship with the material world mm. as opposed to just like looking towards heaven and not focusing on the material world. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I would say um, orthodoxy tends to accept more the material world, you know, and we see this um, in that historically the Orthodox Church has been united with empires, for example, and we haven't been afraid uh, of that, <clears throat> that we don't reject the material world or the natural human order, but that we try to achieve this symphonia, the symphony, this uh, uh, cooperation with the material world. And we see in our day, unfortunately, you know, if you look at, um, you know, you look at some of these, I have in my mind these images of, of India, for example, where you can just see there's trash in the ocean and like there's just waste fields, of trash, trash, trash everywhere. This is kind of how man in our greed is using the world, right? It's turning the world into this kind of trash receptacle. <clears throat> but that's not the orthodox ethos. The orthodox ethos we would say is liturgical. Why? What, what do we mean by liturgical? What happens in the liturgy? What happens in the liturgy is that the people bring to the priests and the church bread, which we call a prospora, which has a seal on it that we cut out, and that becomes the body of Christ that we all commute up from this loaf of bread. And the people bring wine, right? And what, how are those things made? They're things that God has given us. God causes the sun to shine. God causes the rain to fall so that wheat and grapes can grow. Man, in his ingenuity, his creativity that God has given only to him, he, unlike any of the animals, are, is able to cultivate the wheat and the grapes and, and make bread and wine out of them, right? So man takes what God has given him. He adds his own creativity uh, so that he can sustain his own life. But then what does he do before he eats it himself? He offers it to God, right? So this is why the tradition comes in the Old Testament, first and foremost, of offering the first 10% to God, right? The first 10%. So first we take whatever God has given us, we offer it up to God in the Eucharist, and it returns down to us, God gives it back to us as the body and blood of his, of his son, Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> to feed us, nourish us both physically and spiritually. Because it doesn't cease to be bread and wine, but it also becomes the body and blood of Christ. So this is what we would call a liturgical ethos. We take with, with gratitude what God has given us, we add our human endeavor to it, we offer it to God, and he gives it back to us for our continued nourishment. 
So it's this constant giving and taking, giving and taking, right? <clears throat> the constant thanking of God, he gives us. Thank you again, he gives us back. Um, this is this is kind of what we would call the liturgical ethos that we would say should shape our view toward the world, toward ecology, toward uh, um, toward our treatment of animals, etc. <clears throat> that we are the stewards of creation, and that again we are this bridge, the only animal, the only part of creation that's able to look up and to uh, try to connect our material world with God. Right, so man, all of us, not just me as a priest, but all of us are priests of creation, are called to be priests of creation. So this is the attitude that should inform us um, with all of our things. So whatever it is that we have, you know, we work, God has given us certain talents, right? <laughs> uh, we add our own hard work. Each of us, I'm guessing, has, has a job we go to, we work hard, we get some material benefit from that. But then we offer back, since God is the one giving it to us, we add our human creativity, our human effort to what God has given us, and it produces this bounty. We offer 10% of it to God. Uh, and then liturgically, that's that's kind of symbolized by the bread and wine. We offer that first to God, and then he gives it back to us again and more blessings. So this should be our attitude generally. We take what we have, we offer a portion of it to God, to our fellow man, and God returns it to us. So are you kind of saying that this ethos extends beyond liturgy, yes. but the liturgy is sort of like the main, what everything revolves about. Yeah, so we call it the liturgy after the liturgy. So the, this is a, a concept that's uh, kind of been fleshed out more recently by some uh, big theologians. <laughs> but the liturgy after the, the liturgy is the first step, but it can't end there, right? So we have to, we have this communion with God. Uh, it, it can't end there. We have to go out from the world. And, and you can imagine it like a heartbeat, right? So our lives as Orthodox Christians should be in rhythm, right? It should be like a heartbeat. And how does the heart work? It works by, dia, dia, how do you say that in English? Diastole and systole. Uh, the heart works like this. So in other words, we come together in the heartbeat. Uh, we come together from where we're spread out. And we gather as one into the church. Then we offer our prayers up to God. He offers his blessings back down to us. And we go out again to the world to spread the good news, to spread what we've seen in the church, that we've seen the resurrected Christ, that we've experienced him. You know, this should be our rhythm as well. Um, so the liturgy after the liturgy is, okay, we come together, we offer up our prayers, God sends us his blessings, but that's not the end of it, right? The liturgy after the liturgy then is we go out. And we spread that ethos to the world by visiting the sick, by helping the poor, by loving our fellow man, it's by being good stewards of creation, etc. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, I don't want to tire you guys out too much. So everyone, everyone good? I'll stay, I'll stay for a few minutes if anybody has any questions or wants to tell me. I have no idea what you guys just talked about for the last time. <laughs> All right. God bless you guys. We'll be back here next week for part two.